Sir, your never-ending pasta bowl. Oh, thanks. If you need anything else, just let me... Done. Excuse me? I'm done. Ready for more pasta. You said it's never-ending, right? Well, yes. Great. Also, I downed the breadsticks and salad. Those are unlimited too, correct? Oh, dear. Now, is the soup endless? Because if so, I'll order that too. And, you know, tell you what, I'm going to need a second never-ending pasta bowl just to get a couple in rotation. I'm going to be here a while, and I'm planning on eating a lot of pasta. Honey, it's me. Sell all of our Olive Garden stock right now. Yeah, he's back. Free refills on soda, correct? Thanks. Internet, welcome to Food Theory, where with science, all things are possible. All right, I'll admit it, theorists, I've been daydreaming about Olive Garden a lot lately. Like, an unhealthy amount. Though, when it comes to Olive Garden, is there really any other kind? See, their food hasn't touched my lips since the pandemic started, but what else can I do? It's not like I'm gonna order Olive Garden as delivery. Ugh, that defeats the whole purpose. Olive Garden is one of those restaurants that has to be done in person if you're gonna do it right, because as everyone knows, the minute you sit down inside of an Olive Garden, they start throwing endless and bottomless foods at you from all directions. Breadsticks, soups, salads, pasta, until you leave the restaurant an hour later with enough extra calories in your stomach to keep you in the gym for a week, which is both awesome and awful, because the Venn diagram for reasons pasta is delicious and reasons pasta is unhealthy is basically one circle. But here's what I've been noodling about recently, friends. What if that wasn't the case? What if you could enjoy all those tasty carbs on your lips and they wouldn't wind up forever on those hips? Theorists, I wanted to make today's episode because there are some really interesting science-based reasons to believe that pasta can be made healthier. Not by altering the recipe, but by simply changing the temperature. Not to go full clickbait on you, friends, but there's really no other way to put it. This one trick makes food instantly healthier. So grab a fork, theorists, because if I'm right about this one, the pasta abilities are endless. First, let's talk pasta. Is it healthy or isn't it? Because I feel like pasta is just one of those foods that's gone in and out of style like 10 times during my life. These days, I hear a lot about the carbs it contains. And yet, when I was in grade school, this is what got drilled into my brain every single day. The food pyramid, which celebrated grains as the literal foundation of a healthy diet. So what is the deal here? Is pasta good or is it bad? Well, on one hand, pasta is a source of fiber, protein, and a slew of vitamins and minerals. On the other, yeah, it contains a lot of carbohydrates. Now, carbs are great for energy, which is why, for instance, marathon runners will load up on carbs before a race. But for those of us not running marathons on the reg, an excessive amount of carbs ain't great. Particularly refined carbs like the ones found in regular pasta, as opposed to whole wheat pasta, which isn't typically the default option when you order pasta at a restaurant. My local Olive Garden, for instance, doesn't currently have whole wheat linguine on the menu, but they've served it to me every time I've asked for it in the past. According to Healthline, quote, eating refined carbs is linked to drastically increased risk of many diseases, including obesity, heart disease, and type 2 diabetes. Still, even though pasta has plenty of carbs, it's by no means the highest carb food out there. I'm looking at you, french fries. Plus, pasta has a pretty low glycemic index, which is a value assigned to foods based on how slowly or how quickly those foods cause increases in blood glucose levels. So with all those nutrients and a relatively low glycemic index, why does pasta get a bad rap? Simply put, portion control. See, a serving size of pasta is supposed to be a half cup, which is a lot less than you would think. And it is definitely a lot less than the plate of pasta you're making for yourself at home, and certainly less than what you get served at Olive Garden. How many servings are contained in a never-ending pasta bowl? A tad bit higher than a recommended daily dose. Now, when we say that pasta has a lot of carbohydrates, what we really mean is that it has a lot of glucose molecules. The word carbohydrate is derived from carbon and hydrate. As you can see from glucose's structure, it's more or less six carbon atoms with six H2O molecules attached. Now, pasta doesn't have a bunch of free glucose molecules floating around in it. What it has are long strands of glucose molecules linked together. These long glucose strands can come in different lengths and arrangements, but generally they're referred to as starches. When we ingest a starchy food like pasta, bread, or potatoes, the salivary enzyme amylase gets to work right away in the mouth, and it begins breaking the long starch chain down into shorter chunks. This process continues in the small intestine where it eventually becomes individual glucose molecules. And see, that is what our body needs for energy, but as long as the glucose molecules remain in their long starch chains, they can't be absorbed. Okay, so remember how I said that starches can come in a bunch of different 
arrangements? Well, some of those arrangements are very easy for our body's enzymes to break apart. In this case, our small intestine will successfully absorb a whole bunch of free glucose molecules. Our blood sugar will spike, and all those unhealthy, dangerous things that we discussed earlier could occur. However, sometimes glucose molecules are arranged into starches that are a lot tougher to break down. These starches are resistant to digestion, which is why they're called resistant starches. Who names these things, by the way? I feel like there could have been more creativity involved. If I made a scientific discovery, I'd have more fun with it, you know? Like, starch nemesis, Tony Starch. Uh, like and subscribe to Food Theory Starch. You know, something like that. Anyway, resistant starches can be so difficult and take so long to break apart that they pass all the way through our entire digestive system to the colon and even beyond without getting fully broken down. That means not all of the glucose molecules get broken off the starch chain, which means your body effectively gets fewer carbs. So at long last, this all brings us back to Olive Garden, because the starches in your piping hot, freshly boiled pasta actually become more resistant as the pasta cools down. And yes, this applies to other starchy foods too, like potatoes and peas. If you've ever noticed how day-old leftover pasta in the fridge has an almost crispy texture, that's because it has more resistant starches in it than before, thereby making cold pasta healthier than freshly boiled pasta. Bazinga! Okay, so I can feel you theorists at home rolling your eyes, saying to yourself, gee thanks, Matt Pat. You roped us in with that clickbait thesis statement earlier, and now you're gonna tell us that we have to suffer through eating cold pasta in order to glean the benefits of resistant starches. And alright, I admit, I can see where you'd get that idea if you stopped watching the video right now. Because here's the big twist, friends. A 2009 study shows that reheated pasta actually contains more resistant starch than the cold pasta. So boiled's the worst, cold second best, and reheated is the best best. And if you repeatedly cool and reheat your pasta, the presence of resistant starches only accumulates. Basically, it's kind of a what doesn't kill you makes you stronger kind of thing, except it uh, makes you more of a resistant starch. Okay, so the science is telling us that cooling and reheating your pasta increases its starch resistance. Our understanding of digestion tells us that higher starch resistance means that it's harder for our body to break down and therefore should lessen spikes in blood sugar. But I'm not okay just leaving this thing with a should. Is there actual proof of this working in the real world? Or is it all theoretical? Food theoretical! Yeah, it doesn't quite have the same ring to it, does it? Well, I'm happy to report, friends, that such an experiment was performed on the British television program Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. They measured the blood sugar of volunteers after eating fresh, cold, and reheated pasta. And the results are precisely what we would expect. The largest spikes in blood sugar occurred with fresh pasta, and the smallest spikes resulted from reheated pasta. Granted, this was a small-scale experiment on a TV show, but other, more extensive studies have also been carried out, and they also support the same findings. So if you're like me and your desire to eat healthy is constantly at odds with your desire to eat your body weight at Olive Garden, you can rest a little bit easier tonight knowing that there's still a way to make the huge, unhealthy meals that you love a little bit less unhealthy. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to A, reheat my Olive Garden leftovers multiple times, and B, thank Audible, the sponsor for today's episode. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment all in one place. We're talking audiobooks, podcasts, comedy, theatrical performances, you name it. Thousands of titles, people. Thousands. And its library of content is constantly getting updated with new and great stuff. Look, I'd love to sit here and tell you that I use it exclusively for highbrow literature or whatever, but I'm not even gonna lie. These days, I'm in a constant state of listening to and re-listening to FNAF books for our game theory episodes. What? Don't look at me like that. Guys, there are so many of these darn books. What else am I gonna do? I'm MatPat. I gotta stay on top of this stuff. And Audible is a huge reason I'm able to. The fact that I can listen to a portion of an audiobook on my phone in the car and then pick up from the exact same spot later in the day on my tablet at home is just one of the reasons I love using Audible. Let's face it, adulting is miserable. And finding time for yourself just gets harder when you have a two-year-old in your life. And so Audible being available whenever and wherever I want to listen to it allows me to carve off some me time while I'm doing the mundane tasks of cleaning and cooking and all that awful stuff that has to get done. Then you only have like a half hour to yourself before you pass out from exhaustion. So at least let me listen to a book or a podcast that I want to that makes it feel like I have a modicum of me time still. Sorry, was that too real? Another reason I love Audible is that they let me dial the narration speed up. Team 1.5 times speed, where are you at? Basically, Audible is everything I love to listen to all in one app. If you haven't tried it out, I cannot recommend 
Audible enough. Head over to audible.com slash food theory, F-O-O-D-T-H-E-O-R-Y, or, you know, just text food theory to 500-500. New members can always try Audible for 30 days, Audible's treat. Again, visit audible.com slash food theory or text food theory to 500-500. Whether you plan to use it for entertainment, for self-betterment, or, you know, for boning up on your indie horror game lore, you'll be glad that you did it. Thanks for watching. Thanks again for our wonderful sponsor, Audible. And just remember that it's all a theory. A food theory. Bon appetit.